Hey, what's up? What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to the Periodic Table. This is the show where we break down the science news of the week, and we learn along with you, the audience. Yes, with you, because we are just as clueless about some of these topics, but we're here to learn. We're here to gain a better understanding. I am, of course, your host, Brandon Hanna. I have over nine years of experience as a mechanical engineer in the aerospace industry. Of course, you know me from AfterBuzz TV and the Popcorn Talk Network and the movie trivia Schmodown, which you might be a little more familiar with some of our guests today. Well, both of our guests. There's not that many guests. There's only two. So let's <laughs> start off with the one to my immediate left. Uh, you know him. You love him. He was here with us just last week. He's a streamer, engineering cam operator for SEN and the Gucci verse. It's Dwayne Burke. Dwayne, super happy to have you here today. Hey, I'm glad to be back. <laughs> super glad to have you back. Um, super excited to also uh, announce our next guest. To some of you, he may need no introduction. He kind of does it all. He's a producer, actor, comedian, and of course, one of the best managers in the movie trivia Schmodown. It's Mr. John Kaiser. Sir, they don't pay either of you enough money for what you bring to not only the Schmodown, but to entertainment in general. Uh, you both are giants of the industry, and it's, it's an honor to be here as usual. I find you two to be two of the more intellectual fellows in, in, in this league. There's a lot of nimrods, so it's always <laughs> nice to chat with you guys. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for the kind words. I'm not used to getting that from you, uh, at least not unironically. So uh, it's fun to step outside from the Schmodown a little bit and get into, uh, as you say, a more intellectual Space. world of science. And yes. Uh, all kinds of different science. Uh, maybe we'll get into a little bit of space today. Uh, we've got some really fun topics. Um, speaking of movies, uh, right off the bat, we have the Greenland director studied the science of comets to be better prepare for his disaster film. We have ivory from a 16th century shipwreck reveals new details about African elephants. And we do have a Christmas themed special segment as this is the last show before Christmas. Um, it's the scientific guide to a better Christmas dinner. How can science help make your Christmas dinner taste just a little bit better? We're going to dive into that and find out just a little bit. But before we do, let's jump all the way back up to our first topic. Greenland director studied the science of comets. This is something we've seen before. We've seen Christopher Nolan uh, talk to physicists to better understand interstellar you know this is something too that bad that couldn't help the end of that movie because the third <laughs> act is trash <laughs> <laughs> there's only so much science can do to help improve the movies unfortunately uh creative liberties uh will definitely be taken with greenland i imagine uh i mean i love gerard butler jerry b as much as the next guy but I don't know. This is certainly not going to be a documentary. I think the director in this interview says as much. Um, but he did say he tried to become his own aficionado in researching the science of small bodies in space. Um, Greenland, of course, um, you know, let's just plug the movie for them. It's going to be released on HBO Max yesterday, I believe. Um, and so the director, Rick Roman Wow, I'm sorry if I'm butchering that. I apologize. Roman oh, Reigns wow. directed a movie? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, and he did his own research into the science of comets. He spoke with scientists. Good. He spoke like, with scientists uh, Kaiser, you might be familiar with this. He spoke with scientists at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Interesting. Uh, well, and studying his own to, to better understand what would happen if a comet came to Earth. So, uh, Kaiser, let's uh, start off with you. Um, what do you think about this article? I, I know, I know you, 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 you're a fan of space as well, and oh, yeah. you might have some experience uh, in that department. Uh, super space nerd. I don't have the you know SAT scores to support that, but I certainly have the interest level. And I have to say, you know, working in television and film for you know over ten years, probably one of my most fun jobs ever was on Through the Wormhole with Morgan Freeman, Science Channel show. We had the opportunity to go to JPL, which was the coolest field trip any space sci-fi nerd can ask for. Um, first of all, what I thought was interesting is this thing that's supposedly hurtling towards the planet in this film is a six mile radius. So that's like the size of Las Vegas, right? Or no, was that the, the, the meteor that crashed into Earth and killed the dinosaurs was a six mile radius? Am I getting confused? 
Uh, yeah, six miles. Uh, the one for the dinosaurs. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah. so to me, can you imagine Las that Las Vegas, that heaping ball of trash, hurtling through Earth? No wonder it killed the dinosaurs. Nothing's gonna survive a fucking <laughs> a meteor full of Las Vegas sweat, grime, alcohol, like other weird bodily fluids. So, I mean. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I got to say, go JPL. Is, uh, th so this man actually went to JPL. He studied with these scientists. Is that accurate? This director, Richard Wonton or whatever his name is? Yeah, it looks like he spoke to a scientist at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory and also did some studying on his own. He he specifically, like you mentioned, he studied um, the extinction level event that, that killed off the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Um, six miles, 10 kilometers, if you want to get into the metric system. Uh, wide was that asteroid so yeah um so yeah he looked at something that had already happened and tried to um use that information to predict what could possibly happen oh, hit the mic uh, in this fictional universe that he's creating for his film which i think is, it's how a lot of predictions um are made in the scientific community obviously this with not so much um detail or so much um, care to attention because at the end of the day, this is a Gerard Butler movie. Uh, <laughs> Dwayne, uh, what are your overall thoughts on this? And I want to ask an important question. Um, how responsible are directors for making their movies scientifically accurate? Uh, I, I think the most interesting part about this article in particular was when he got to the point, he's like, nobody can agree on what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and it sounds about right. Cause nobody can agree on anything even when presented with the facts um, no one can agree with what happened with the dinosaurs is that accurate is that what you're talking about exactly what like they they know what the effect on the planet was but they no one agrees on what was the thing that actually killed like which part of it killed the dinosaurs i see was it i see because there's theories on well it wiped out all the food and they starved and there was a, maybe it caused an explosion and wiped them out but then again, if it had caused an explosion and wiped them all out, there wouldn't be fossils. Am I right with this? I mean, there would be nothing but dust. So wouldn't you side towards the whole, it killed their ecosystem, their food chain? I mean, wouldn't that be the leading idea? I mean, yeah. my, the combination of, of everyone's theories, I'm, mm -hmm. there, I'm, I'm sure that we're close enough that they were vaporized. <laughs> There's others that were far enough away that... They just got buried under, you know, cosmic dust and ended up getting pressurized and turned into fossils, coal, you know. Right. XB. Um, but what I, is the estimate of the year that that happened? Um, million? Year? Well, it says 66 million years ago. 66 million so years if ago. we want to try to backtrack and do that math from 2020, I, I'm already out. I, yeah. I'm I'm already, yeah. Math. I was I was told there'd be no math. No, yeah, well, just it's think basically it's, still you rounded up. It's still sixty six negative. Uh, I don't know sixty six million BC ish. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I gotta tell you, man. If uh, if Gerard uh, Gerard Butler lived sixty six million years ago, he would have stopped that damn fucking <laughs> asteroid in its tracks. He probably would have caught up like uh, Leonides or something and just smashed the damn thing. But Abs absolutely, I believe yeah, it. I and it, well, as yeah. as far Sorry. as your your uh, as far as your, your question, I I think if you're going to present a movie as being educational or to broaden someone's understanding, then you have a responsibility to be accurate. But if if that's not what you're what you're going for, like then have fun with it. I mean. Last time I checked, we can't make rocks float or, you know, wave our hand and make people believe whatever we want. Don't be want them to believe, no but I know where you're going. No, 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 I'm not going to drop any spoilers. I'm just right, saying, but like the, the, what the biggest franchise in the world is a galaxy far, far away that mm. is nowhere near scientifically accurate. So like, <laughs> I, I, I think if that's what you're going for, then I mean, ha have all the liberties you want, but if you're talking about you know something that really happened an actual historical event there is some responsibility to present it accurately or if you're talking about you know 
Uh, what was that movie with the windshield wipers? I can't one remember. With, one with Tom Hardy in the car? No, it was with... Uh, oh, God damn it. I forgot his name. But it was about the guy who invented the, the Greg windshield Kinnear, wiper. Greg Kinnear. Yeah, Greg Kinnear. Uh, like that, I think that requires some accuracy. You know? Um, oh, God. Why am I forgetting the name of the movie? With Octavia Spencer and... Uh, I think we're all blanking on the, the title oh of this Oh, my film. God. Space Camp. No, the ast the the god damn it. <laughs> oh, what is wrong with my brain today? Um but the the NAS the NASA ma mathematicians that helped get everyone to the the black women they got everyone Oh yeah, to, uh hidden figures. Hidden okay. figures, there you go. Okay. I don't know why I could not pull that <laughs> from my head. But uh but like that movie that needed that needs to be accurate not just because of the fact that it was an actual occurrence, but because of what, like that story has never been told before. So like it, it needs to be accurate. I'm going to put it to you this way. The making of, uh, what was the McConaughey movie? We were just talking about Chris Nolan interstellar. The making of interstellar was better to me than the movie. Like everything Nolan did and all the physicists and shit that he interviewed that I I, I'm pretty sure there's a available documentary or something but just watching, you know, Nolan is is obviously a attention to detail. You know, he's not going to put anything. He's not going to half step any way of the process. So to me, I mean, make it as accurate as possible. Now, I think Dwayne's presupposing that in a galaxy far, far away, people can't have British accents, and I don't know if that's completely true or not. <laughs> we know, but I think you. I mean, I'll tell you what. My favorite, and I guess if you want to call it a science movie, I guess you technically could space movie certainly the right stuff, right, Dwayne? There's one you got to get. Those, those are people's lives, like you said. Like, and I think it makes for a more compelling story, quite frankly. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so there, there, I think, so I think we're all kind of in agreement when it's like a historical event, there is some degree of responsibility to make things scientifically accurate. Definitely, this is a, like throw popcorn in your mouth, like enjoy 90 minutes of disaster type movie, I'd imagine, um, without seeing it. But I also do think that with something like Interstellar, it is important to try to get the science as accurate as possible because it's those types of movies that I feel like inspire the next generation of astronauts and scientists and engineers and all the people over at NASA that make this type of of science and technology and exploration possible because i mean as kids we all grow up watching these movies um you know part of the reason i became a mechanical engineer why i wanted to work in the aerospace industry is you know i did um i watched a lot of documentaries on the apollo space program for one that was the main mm -hmm. thing but also what got me interested in space at all is i grew up watching something like star wars um which you know, say what you want about British people in space. There definitely should be Boston accents in space. Though, I agree. I, I agree. Give Hammerhead <laughs> a Boston accent. I mean, uh, try something different. So, I mean, what is the premise of this movie? A meteor is coming towards the Earth, and Ger Gerard Butler's got to get his family to their neck, their uh, their in laws' house. Or what basically. is it? It yeah. basically sounds like 2012, but there's a comet instead of just the world. Uh, collapsing for no apparent reason. Well, I'll tell character. you a movie that maybe wasn't particularly strong overall, but I feel like felt like if the shit really went down, it would be like this. That's Spielberg's War of the Worlds. Like the perspective of it all, like the the disarray, like the, the real life conversations he's having with his kids. Like there's something like especially the first thirty minutes of that movie, I think, is quite brilliant compared to the rest of the film. Um, so I, I appreciate that when you really put me there and give me that vibe and make me feel like I think Gareth Edwards is one of as a director who gets that. And when you look at his films like Monsters and certainly Rogue One, he's he's he, and Godzilla especially, he's a master of perspective. You know, when Godzilla's walking across the city and you know you see some guy standing at the fucking uh, copy machine, it feels like it looks and feels as if that's how it would be. And I think that's a credit to to, to great artists. So I, I'm a strong, strong fan. Gareth is one of my favorite directors, at least from a cinematic standpoint. I think that's a guy that tries to get it right and often does. Yeah, and I think that's, uh, looking at the article, that is kind of what this director is, tr is really trying to do with this film. 
um, you know, uh, yes, try your best to get the the science as accurate as possible. But at the end of the day, this is the story about the from the perspective of a family looking at this global disaster event, uh, which I think sounds right up your alley, Kaiser. And what I appreciate ab ab here is um, it says without giving anything away, the director tried to make the the uh, the film's comet, which is I guess they call Clark. Um, follow mm -hmm. a plausible track to Earth, um, while one main fragment gives humanity a lot of worry. Smaller offshoots periodically slam through the atmosphere and cause local havoc. So, as far as the trajectory of the comet, how it impacts the atmosphere, um, the director really tried to make that as scientifically accurate as possible, which is something mm -hmm. I appreciate. Sure. And then everything past that is just movie magic. So, oh yeah, for sure, for sure. <laughs> Um, but with all that being said, um, and before we get into the next topic, I thought I would take advantage of the fact of we're talking about science and movies, how responsible are directors for making science realistic, science plausible on film. I just want to announce here, boom, there it is. I am working on a film physics Christmas special talking about um, the physics of Die Hard, specifically that scene you see there right in the graphic, John McClane leaping off a building uh, strapped to nothing but a fire hose. Um, just how plausible <laughs> is that? Uh, well, we're going to find out. So keep your eyes peeled for that, uh, uh, releasing it soon uh, for you guys to enjoy a little bit of science this holiday season. Um, Not only I, the greatest holiday movie of all time, <laughs> but the greatest movie of all time, Die Hard. Uh, well, I'm glad. I, I hope you guys are excited. Um, it's uh, It should be a lot of fun. Um, and also, just a reminder for everyone watching, please like this video. If you're in the live chat, you know, get involved. Talk to one another. Um, let's make this a real community, a classroom, as you will. Talking about science, um, subscribe to this channel if you like this uh, show and you want to keep watching every week and be here with us. Hit that little notification bell. Uh, it's really appreciated. goes a long way. And leave a comment down below um, if you're watching after the fact or if you just want to help with the algorithm. Let's get some more views on this show because I really enjoy doing it every week. Um, so let's jump into our... Well, real quick, can I ask one more question? Because this sounds oh, great. Sure. Go right I, got a comment. I got a comment question. Yeah, you know how NASA can, and JPL have launched satellites to to study asteroids up close, and to the point where I know when, when I worked on an episode of Through the Wormhole, we went to JPL. We interviewed these three guys who are probably your guys' age, which is amazing to me that people that young are that brilliant, who built this spider-like satellite thing that was going to shoot out, land on an asteroid, a drill comes out pulls samples out and that thing is literally flies back to earth seven years later, whatever it is. So, okay. So no, we, now we can study asteroids up close and personal. We can land on them. What, what is the, what is this, the physics of, of comets? Can we not get that close? Is it too cold? Will they burn out? Like, I don't understand how you study these things. And if you can up close and personal. Yeah, that's a really good question. Actually. Um, I don't know if I have a, a clear answer uh, for you, uh, Dwayne. Do I'm you asking, have any? I'm asking the universe right now. Maybe <laughs> someone in the chat. Knows. Maybe somebody in the chat has um, a better understanding of comets versus asteroids and what we can do and can't. Yeah, I mean, I I don't have an exact answer. I would imagine that it's because of the composition, probably, because I, I think asteroids tend to be more like. Um, rock. like mineral rock Metallic. like type 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 composition and i think comets are more like gas ice like different different i i think they're just different composition i think that might be the reason i, I don't know though don't quote me on that <laughs> i think I, yeah i think that's a really uh, good way to describe it without getting into too many specifics um but yeah no that's a really interesting thing uh, I would like to know that. yeah that you brought up um it's, it really is fascinating. And not only, I mean, speaking of like these types of disaster movies, I mean, we have scientists here on Earth working on what if an asteroid is on trajectory to hit Earth. And there's some really cool ways, um, similar to what you just described, where, you know, not quite the Armageddon, let's blow the thing up uh, method, which right. uh, maybe I can do a film physics on that one day, even though I feel like it's been done to death. But 
um, you know, you can take something like a probe and instead of landing it like on uh, the like asteroid, you can mm -hmm. fly it like alongside it. And it's right. like a little bit of a gravitational pull. All oh, right. Of course. It's it just enough off its trajectory, even if you can get it like one degree off of its trajectory yeah. over the course of millions of miles that it has to travel to get to Earth, it'll it'll miss yeah. it completely. So right. I know that. That's something that can be done. I'd imagine you could do that same thing maybe with a comet. I don't know. I don't know exactly. That's a little I bit above my pay grade. The European Space Agency, I think, was attempting it. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at here. Oh, they okay. The European Space Agency made history by landing on a comet in 2015 with Rosetta, which I assume is some sort of satellite, which is collecting data continually to help scientists learn about the birth of our world, right? Okay. So that makes sense because a comet hits the earth and it changes everything, right? It changes what the vegetation temperature. I don't, you know, I'm, I don't know yeah. exactly what changes when that happens. Well, I mean, the, I, there's been talks about it as like the best thing that could happen for global warming is for like a comet to hit the, to hit the world that real? because it, it would, it, it would, because not just because of the, human impact but because of the dust and everything that gets kicked up into the atmosphere it would actually prevent the sun from heating the the planet that's and and that that would actually drop the the average temperature i think it's like five or six degrees or something like that was what was what was hypothesized if we had another extinction level event <laughs> happen well, the universe likes to correct itself so everybody be on yeah. the lookout we done fucked this planet up so get ready <laughs> life finds a way life uh finds a way and we've lost kaiser <laughs> while, while he's taking a short break here um i just want to thank everyone in the chat for watching specifically i just want to point out bcd haskell 420 william belford will mcclain um i'm so sorry who did i just miss jeremy miller thank you so much for being here first time watcher um and jake yakavetta i believe i saw too so thank you guys for being in the chat being active with your hot takes belford saying deep impact is greater than armageddon that's a discussion for another time but i think it is time that we jump into our next topic which is ivory from a 16th century shipwreck reveals new details about African elephants. This is something uh, Kaiser and I were already talking about this before going live. Um, so basically, uh, in 2008, miners off the coast of Nam -Ibi Namibia? Namibia. Namibia. Thank you, Dwayne. Namibia. For correcting my, this is why I bring Dwayne on board. He knows. In Italian, that's Mamma Mia. <laughs> Shitty but these miners stumbled upon buried treasure, a sunken Portuguese ship. Uh, known as the bomb Jesus, I would imagine is the pr proper pronunciation. That's, yes. how, that's how I'm known in Nambia. Uh, when I walked on the streets, I like <laughs> bomb Jesus, bomb Jesus. Oh my goodness. And you know what? I actually believe that for some reason. Um, Very well liked anyway, there. This Portuguese ship went missing on its way to India all the way back in 1533. And this trading ship bore a trove of gold and silver coins and other valuable materials. But to a team of archaeologists and biologists, the bomb Jesus's most precious cargo was a haul of more than 100 elephant tusk, which is the largest archaeological cargo of African ivory ever discovered. And there is so much to get into uh, in this article. The, the implications, not just for what scientists know about these elephants from 500 years ago, but also the ivory trade from 500 years ago. Before I just start rambling off and geeking uh, up, up out about all this uh, information, Dwayne, I just want to start with you right off the bat. What were your overall thoughts on this article, this scientific discovery? And are there any specific pieces of it that really stick out to you as like, wow, this is really interesting to me? Uh, I think the coolest part is, the, I think it's at the tail end of the article, they talk about how they could start tracking the ivory trade through because they don't know where the ivory originated from. Like if it came from a bunch of different ports or did it come through like one hub? And then because they said it, it was, it was all from different parts of 
Africa, like different regions. So how did it get on this one ship? And I think that's interesting because it, it, it has implications of not only uh, showing us kind of the trade in Africa back in that point in time, but I think the larger implications and sorry, sorry for bringing this. I'm sure this will bring some sort of heat, but that could give us implications into like the slave trade and like mm -hmm. where ancestors are from, things like that. Just because of like, we don't know a lot about African trade at the time because we don't have a whole lot of our history left. Mm -hmm. And this could help give us that. That's interesting. Yeah, that's, that's a interesting. really interesting, uh, <laughs> yeah, interesting takeaway. Um, I think that's like, uh, I think this is a perfect example of what science can do um, in so many ways that we don't even expect, like literally learning about human history in ways that we didn't even think because they literally found a 500 year old ship on the bottom of the ocean Crazy. with elephant tusk and they, and they look at, like there's it literally says here that the types of isotopes and carbon and nitrogen in the tusk provided more detail about where these elephant lives carbon and nitrogen accumulate in tusk over an elephant's lifetime through the food the animal eats and the water it drinks and relative amounts of different carbon and nitrogen isotopes depend on whether an elephant spent most of its time in a rainforest or a grassland um and the isotopes found in these uh, elephant tusk revealed a mixture of uh, forests and savannas, different locations um, and uh, different areas where these elephants lived. And literally looking at carbon and nitrogen uh, isotopes inside these bones found at the bottom of the ocean tell us like they paint an entire picture, tell this entire story, um, which is super fascinating. And like you said, Dwayne, it has implications far beyond the scientific community. Um, uh, Kaiser, uh, what are your overall thoughts on this article? Did anything else in particular stick out to you well, that you found interesting? The first question I'm going to ask is who got to keep the money? Like all the gold coins and shit that they found? <laughs> Does that go in a museum like Indiana uh, Jones says? Or? It, it, so it, it normally when you find something like that, you get a percentage <laughs> And then, really, uh, I believe the the country that it's found in gets a percentage, and then the country that it originated from gets really? the rest. Yeah, a lot there's of to feed. Yeah, there's 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 like a certain way that it's it's supposed to be split um, when you when you find it. Mm -hmm. um, but you you do get to keep a large sum of it. It's just you gotta you gotta share it too. I might be in the wrong business. I might need to get into treasure hunting, but mainly, I guess my, so it's, this was a Portuguese ship. So it was a Portuguese ivory dealer who was obviously going to Africa and poaching ivory from these elephants and then piecing out. And then their ship got hit with a wave or whatever. And it crashed because it was right off the coast of Southern Africa. Correct. That's where this all went down. That's where they found yeah. it. If, if it was how going, far, how far yeah, off? if it was going to India, mm -hmm. yeah, they would have had to go around the Cape. Oh, it was going to India. I didn't know yeah. that. So the Portuguese were dealing ivory to 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 India. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's another thing that this also reminds us is there was a time when the Portuguese were like the naval power in the world. Right, right, right. Very interesting. I mean, and 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 basically ivory other than being used for furniture and jewelry, did it have any other significance or was it just all status? Like it kind of still is. I mean, what is, obviously know the value of gold, right? But what is the, yeah. what was the value of ivory and what were they doing with it? I would like to know. Now I've seen obviously enough pictures and read things and furniture and jewelry is the only thing that comes to mind. Is there more they do, they were doing with these, this stuff? Uh, t teeth. I, th I think like uh, dentures. Teeth. Yeah, false teeth was was one thing they were using it for, but for the for the most part, yeah, it's a, it's a status. It, it's always been status cosmetic things. No, mm -hmm. no real like practical need right. for it. I couldn't think of a worse animal on the planet to slaughter than an elephant. I got to put that at the top of my list. Like, I, 
first of all, I know it's pretty much illegal, but I don't know if some countries still allow it. I mean, can you uh, just go into Africa and shoot an elephant? No, no you can't. But what about big game hunters? They're allowed to shoot X, but they can't shoot Y. You're like, how does that all work? It, it, it's per permitted, I'm guessing. So you can um, shoot a gazelle, but you can't shoot an elephant. Yeah. I mean, it, it's it's similar to like the people who get to raft the the Colorado River and the Grand Canyon. Like only a certain number of people get to do it every year. Like like it, it's th there's there are so many regulations when it comes to hunting in Africa. Like mm. because of history, like a historical, of course. Uh, uh, what's what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, whatever. Yeah, but it, it's just. This has happened for so long. Like the continent as a whole has been gutted. Sure. Yeah. And I think that's like a really good point. That's also, there's a little bit about that in the article, um, just talking about how so many different uh, types of elephants have gone extinct. Um, the team that, that um, extracted DNA from 44 of the tusk, um, they were able to determine that um, the shipwreck tusks belong to elephants from at least 17 different distinct herds across West Africa, but only four of those 17 herds still exist today. And they, they credit um, that those other elephant lineages, as they refer to, that died out, they credit that to hunting and habitat destruction. Um, so basically humans. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so this also uh, gives the scientific community more information of how they can better preserve um, the species going forward and protect them from extinction, um, knowing the different regions that these elephants uh, were from, I feel like gives them a better idea of how to protect um, the elephants that are unfortunately the small amount that are left right. um, for future poachers and, 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 you know, uh, habitat destruction, as it says, uh, as well. Have either of you ever stood next to an elephant or touched one? I've ridden I one. A, You've ridden time. a freaking elephant, bro? Yeah. Where? Thailand. Wow. Were you there for the military? Yeah. Were you there for a while? No, nah, I was only there for like a week. <laughs> you got no kids there or nothing? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to say this. I worked at, when I used to work at PBS, we, we, uh, did the day in the life of the zoologist and, uh, for a kid show we used to do. And I know this is going to sound so like something I'm saying to make a joke and it's absolutely true, but here goes the day we went there to film with these zoologists, they were artificially inseminating a female elephant. Okay. I'm not going to get into the, the graphic discussion of all that, but it looked like it involved a wiffle ball bat and uh, a long, long, long rubber <laughs> glove that went to the shoulder. And I'm telling you, I'm sitting next to this thing and I'm like, if this thing wants to step on me, it can step on me. If it, they're just, I'm going to tell you something. You look into an elephant's eye, you can read a lot, man. You can see what that, that thing knows what it's capable of. It's, it's like somehow they're the most docile, you know, like animal on the planet, but at the same time could be the most destructive. There's something majestic about those things. I don't know. So it's sick that people have to kill these things for ivory and whatever, but not to go on a tirade about that. But what I'm getting at is they're just magical, magical animals. The fact that this ivory was preserved so well after 500 years, like, cause I saw the pictures. I mean, they look kind of rotted and stuff, but like, how did they stay so in such, you know, why were they preserved so well is my question. Like, how did that happen? They've been at the bottom of an ocean. Why didn't they? Yeah, I mean, the article credits the preservation to two very specific things. Um, the copper and lead in the ship actually pushed the ivory down into the seabed. Um, oh, wow. And also, just because of how cold the, the ocean sure. uh, current is in that region of the Atlantic, um, that yeah. combination of the cold water and the ivory being in the seabed was able to preserve um, these elephant tusks for 500 years. It's amazing. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing. Like, I'll just like, I mean, how lucky is that? Just like, yeah. like, it, like, it's like every, 
all the, everything coming together, like the yeah. fact that this ivory was even on this ship to begin with, and it crashed. If this if this ship didn't sink, we wouldn't eat, we wouldn't have this data. You know, if this ship made its way to India yeah. and all was well, we wouldn't have this data, and we wouldn't have this small little glimpse into into human history uh, of the ivory trade of elephant species at the time, and and the unfortunate trajectory of their uh, extinction. Um, yeah, that's pretty, so, pretty interesting. Pretty, yeah. and, 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 and there's only four of these species left. These, this particular elephant, is that accurate? Uh, it's yeah. Only, only four of the 17 um, genetically distinct herds um, that, that they were able to get out of these 44 tusks that, that they were successfully able to extract DNA from, uh, yeah, only four of the 17 exist. Did elephants evolve from woolly mammoths, or do I just want to make that up in my head? <laughs> I, unfortunately, I do not have a, a clear answer for that. I mean, there probably is definitely some uh, genetic relation. Right. Yeah. To animals. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, they, they, they split at some point. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Interesting. Well, but yeah, then. there's. Definitely a lot to to unpack here. I think Dwayne made a really uh, great observation about what this information not only tells for um, elephants and the ivory trade, but also on the slave trade. And you know, That's how, fascinating. yeah, and and how this could all be tied together into having a better understanding of you know. Our, our own human history and, mm -hmm. and information that was lost and people don't necessarily know how far back their family tree goes and where they come from. Information like this, scientific discoveries like this can help shed a little bit more light on that. And I think um, that is uh, really, really meaningful um, to, to, to a lot of people out there. So I think that was a really good observation. Have you guys ever heard of Journey of Man by a guy named Spencer Wells. No, I have not. It's, it's fascinating. First of all, Spencer Wells is a, um, you know, he's a doctor of some, I, I, was an, I think he's an anthropologist. I forget exactly what he is. He's in a genetics anthropology, that sort of thing. He wrote a book called The Journey of Man where, and then they made a, they, can, they turned it into a PBS documentary. You guys should watch this thing ASAP, even though it's, came out in probably 2000, 2002, may not have the greatest, you know, graphics and be, you know, it's 20 years ago, roughly when this thing came out. It's a fascinating story because Spencer Wells basically starts in Africa where he traced the first DN genetic, like where, like if you, if you look at us, for instance, we've got way more, you know, to, to our DNA than more, more splits or whatever you want to call it than the first people that he traced this to. So he starts in Africa and literally follows the land bridge that went basically, you know, up north. And I think it comes through, eventually goes into Southeast Asia, the land bridge that connected Asia and uh, um, um, uh, Alaska, right? And then people migrate down through there, become, you know, your Eskimos, Native Americans, et cetera, et cetera. But it, it's basically what this what this proves is that we all came from the same thing. We're all the same person with the same genetic makeup. Pigments changed over time for obvious reasons, and that's why you, why people are different. But it's just a fascinating, fascinating story if you really want to learn how connected we all are. And one last thing, he 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 relayed how connected we all are, not just as humans, but to like. To other species on the planet, even plants for that matter, they took the 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 what is it? So like you know we all what what basically makes eyes in fruit flies, for instance, is a it's a there's a genetic what do they call it a code or a mm -hmm. part of the helix or whatever the part of the helix that causes eyes to grow. They took that from a mouse, put that into a fruit fly, and it grew eyes no problem. So it's just goes to show like how connected everything really really is and even they think into the plant life which is fascinating but check out journey of man very if you can probably find the documentary on youtube i bet it's free most pbs shit is so 
There's yeah, my the Kaiser's Corner right there. <laughs> that, that's really <laughs> fascinating. Kaiser's Corner, soon to be another special segment. Um, before we hop into our current one for today, Dwayne, do you have any closing thoughts on this topic? No, I just, I mean, now I want to go watch this documentary. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm Journey of Man, Spencer Wells. Don't don't forget, you're gonna love it. It's, it it'll blow your mind. I think every human being on the planet needs to watch it because then you, you, people can stop splitting hairs and thinking that we're all from different quadrants of the fucking planet. Like we're all the same thing, man. Get used to it. You know, and there's the science is right there. So yeah, check it out. Check it out. Yeah, definitely check that out. That is your documentary uh, recommendation for the week. Hell, that's another great special segment idea. Kaiser <laughs> bringing the heat today. Attaboy, attaboy. Uh, well, let's jump into something a little more lighthearted. This is the scientific guide to a better Christmas dinner. Um, so this is a fun little uh, video. Um, and there's a transcript of the video in this article as well. As always, guys, links to everything we talk about is in the video description down below. Um, and this is just some really like fun scientific ways of improving your Christmas dinner. Um, starting off with, I wanted to just kind of give a rundown. They give um, some suggestions on how to better improve your Brussels sprouts because let's be honest, sometimes people don't properly season their food oh. or they just don't know how to properly prepare vegetables. Ain't nothing sprouts. worse than a bad Brussels sprout. It's like <laughs> eating a fucking Oof. golf ball, man. And nobody wants to eat golf balls. That's, it, a, it, I mean, look, cooking is chemistry, right? Hannah cooking is chemistry, man. And, yeah. and that's a tough, and that's one you better get it right or you're done. Definitely. And there, I think there's some chemistry in this article first, right off the bat, I'm seeing eat your sprouts with red wine. Um, so, uh, there's a study, I guess that found that drinking red wine reduces the perception of bitterness, uh, when eating Brussels sprouts. Um, so oh. the idea is that the tannins in red wine make proteins in saliva clump together, and this may interfere with the distribution of bitter chemicals in the mouth. It's either that or you're too drunk to care, uh, right. <laughs> in, in the article, either way, um, Especially with Wayne and Kaiser involved, it's probably that's what you probably <laughs> want to bank on. That either way, it's worth a try. Uh, if you're of age, of course, if you're enjoying some Brussels sprouts, uh, this holiday season, maybe have either of you ever had have either of you ever had a sun choke? No, I you brought no that way. up. Uh, the other day, but I, I still have yet to to properly discover it's what that somewhere is. Somewhere between a, a potato and a Brussels sprout. They're phenomenal. It's basically, Dwayne, it's the root, the bulb of a sunflower. Okay. And, and, the, and it's like something you don't see like on the menu quite often, but it's usually like a specialty thing. But oh yeah, that's right, Hannah. We were talking about little doms, I believe. And that's why yeah. that's why that came up. Um, if you ever get a chance, sun chokes. It's for dinner. <laughs> it's for dinner. <laughs> Proceed, Han. I just wanted to put that out there for everyone. I'm, I'm a full of recommendations. No worries. This is, Kaiser has got the recommendations, yeah. guys. Listen to him. Give, give, <laughs> give that a shot. Um, another thing here about Brussels sprouts, I think is actually kind of comical to me, is exposure therapy. Uh, we learned to like <laughs> foods that we dislike by pairing them with ones that we do. So uh, they actually mentioned in one study, children aged three to five were given Brussels sprouts as a snack for 14 days. One group got sprouts on their own and the other with cream cheese. At the end, all the children were given sprouts on their own and asked if they liked them. And among the children who'd eaten sprouts on their own, less than a quarter said they liked the taste. But among the ones that had them with the cream cheese, 72% said that wow. they liked them. So I don't know, maybe try uh, dipping your Brussels sprouts in cream cheese, maybe pairing that with your favorite wine again. I don't know. Um, maybe uh, have it right near the chocolate fountain if you're one of those people who like to get a little fancy uh, for, for their Christmas parties. I don't know. Um, and of course, I believe uh, we have here cook them right. <laughs> cook them right, yeah. That's good like, advice. Sometimes people don't know how to cook their food. Um, make sure you get them nice and golden brown. Um, 
uh, it specifically says to get into the science of it, heat, high heat facilitates the, I never know how to pronounce this word, Maillard reaction in which sugars and amino acids react and produce a wide range of delicious compounds. So if you cook them at the proper temperature, um, there's a certain reaction with the sugars and amino acids that just produces that correct flavor. Yeah. Um, they're tough to make, they're t- but when done, when done properly, they're like the best thing on the planet, man. Like so good. People who live in F- uh, Manhattan Beach, go to the fish bar, try their Brussels sprouts on point. I mean, for for Brussels sprouts in particular, and I think they talked about this in in the article, but uh, Brussels sprouts and artichoke are both um, tougher vegetables, and the easiest way to cook them is fry them. And fry them in a oil with a higher temperature, hmm. um, so not olive oil. Um, hmm. Olive oil burns very, very quickly, or at a very That's like a lower. <laughs> yeah, olive oil burns at a lower temperature, so you'll get like a smoky flavor, and you'll get like a bitter, burnt taste. And especially if you've got Brussels sprouts that are already bitter, you don't right. want more bitter. Right. Um, so use like vegetable oil or like um like baking grease or, or something like that that'll just fry it in that that'll that'll it's a, it's not a foolproof way to cook it but if you're not great at doing it it's an easier way to cook it it's harder to fuck that up mm-hmm. <laughs> i eat my uh, cheerios with bacon grease so i'll uh i'll look at that <laughs> i mean you can't go wrong with bacon grease no you can't I mean, you can't go wrong with bacon at all. And that's here in the article also as a suggestion for a flavor enhancer, along with Parmesan, um, umami, uh, a squeeze of lemon, and maybe a little bit of shallots for sweetness. So um, in other words, pair it up with something good. And of course, don't forget to season your food. I cannot (laughs) emphasize that enough. (laughs) Can we talk about the irony of the white guy saying season your food? (laughs) I know. I know. I understand. I've learned. I've grown. I've become a better, more well-rounded human being in my experiences uh, failing in the kitchen. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, I'm going to have to try the Brussels sprouts. I've never made them in my life. I've, I was too intimidated. I'm like, I, I, I can't do this. I tried I, to make them last week uh, myself, and I didn't get them to a high enough temperature. It was it wasn't yeah, good. Huh? Not good. Was it? <laughs> the cra- the crazy thing is that they're, they're actually like evolved to not be eaten like that's <laughs> they're, they're, yeah they're 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 actually and they they talk about it in the article they release a chemical that makes them taste bad really yeah <laughs> that is interesting and it's to, it's to prevent animals from eating them huh see dude Plants are smart. Don't be fucking with plants, man. I believe I read something like plants are trying to trick humans, like it's like into like. <laughs> I'm serious. Like, there's a book on this. I got to remember what it. Basically, saying that they're it's evolving so that we're enhancing them the way they want to be enhanced, so to speak. I'll have to come back on the next episode and talk to you about that. But there's something there. It had to do with like marijuana strands getting stronger. And I don't know. I'll have to look into it. That sounds like an M. Night Shyamalan yeah. movie. I'll, I'll, tell you know, I'll, just, I'll tell you what. This much I know. Michael J. Fox's wife's brother is an author. And he wrote a book about this. Mm-hmm. So I'll get you one step closer. Well, I know that human beings have genetically modified foods since we've started cooking basically mm-hmm. um we've seen it with with wheat and with corn and rice and all that stuff and it's obviously like it's not like someone in a lab with chemicals it's literally just like crossbreeding and cross-pollinating and getting stuff t- to grow um bigger and better more flavorful the way that we want them so you're telling me this was the plants ideas all along <laughs> plants are smarter than you think pal <laughs> like corn was like i want to be bigger I got a trick. Yes. Humans. yes. There's, something, there's something there. I, I'm, I'm just heard it in passing, but I know it sounds ridiculous, but I'll have to investigate it more for you guys. I think, I think you should do. We'll have you back on the show and you come back to us with the answers of what the plants 
are really up to a plant takeover. Um, <laughs> planning a coup. I hope not. Um, <laughs> but before that happens, we do have holiday dinners to be had. Um, this article also mentions different ideas for improving crispy roasts, as they call it, and Christmas pudding. Um, so if you want to get into more specifics on that, definitely check out this article. There's a lot to unfold, and maybe it just might save your holiday dinner. Um, uh, Dwayne, do, do, do you have any more overall thoughts or things that stood out to you about this article and ways that you might, any, did you take anything away? Things that you might try to, uh, improve your Christmas dinner? Uh, not particularly, but it's because I, I cook a lot. So <laughs> a lot of this was like, I'm like, Oh yeah, I, 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 I know this stuff already, <laughs> but like, I, cause like one of my, um, one of the things I was really looking forward to this year that did not happen uh, because of COVID, but we were supposed to go back to Chicago. And when we went back, I was going to go to a restaurant called Alinea, which they basically cook with science. Like it's, it's, it's gastronomy, but like taken to like another level. Um, like they have like a balloon that's made out of sugar like it's, okay. it's they like make the dessert they like uh they like cook it in nitrogen and then like break it on the table it's 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 crazy like all the different things that they do in this restaurant but they use science to cook your food and it, it's it's That's it's so amazing. cool and i mean granted it's like five hundred dollars per person but like it's it's a once in a lifetime experience, and I was really looking forward to that. And like that's that's why I know a lot of this stuff because I watch shows like about restaurants like this or like cooking shows where it's not cooking with grandma's recipe. It's like how do you take cooking to a scientific level? Yeah, that's fascinating. I don't do any science in the kitchen. A pinch of this, a pinch of that. That's what I learned from my grandmother. But I'll tell you, Dwayne, for Dwayne, for someone like you who gets real nerdy about this. The guy who I was talking about, his name is Michael Pollan. He's the author. That's Michael J. Fox's brother-in-law. Brother and he wrote a book called Cooked, The Natural History of Transformation. A Natural History of Transformation. I just looked it up. I think this is one of those guys like you're talking about really delves into like the science of cooking and, and other things. So I'm also recommending Michael Pollan. <laughs> <laughs> also, you might want if you're if you're looking to learn more about food and caffeine and cooking he's your guy maybe we should start a whole new show on this channel called kaiser's recommendations well, um you've got a lot of great ones yeah i got a couple i got a couple <laughs> uh i myself i um i've evolved to become a little more scientific in the kitchen like very you know i want to make sure i get my measurements right make sure i season everything uh correctly um but i mean i used to just like you said kaiser like a pinch of that a splash of this like that's how my grandma cooks in the yeah, kitchen yeah. as well like obviously like she makes her foods the same every time they're always delicious but she just feels it out it's like and yeah. Yeah. It's like to a certain extent, I don't know how grandmas do that. It's the sort of grandma magic. They just know like this much milk, this much salt, like just feeling it out. I remember and I, I kind of would do that sometimes uh, in the kitchen uh, with my old roommate. And he's the kind of person who would measure everything specifically. Mm -hmm. Look at me. He's like, what are you doing? Like, You're not measuring that? And I'm like, nah, it's fine. It's, this is the right amount of milk. No. It's all good. I mean, yeah. Well, I, I, don't I don't measure anything, mm -hmm. but... What, what I meant is, or what I get out of like the science part of it is like when you learn why does like citrus go so well with something that's been fried? Like why does, you know, why do these things work? And it's because like the acid in the citrus helps your um the fat dissolve on your tongue like like learning those types of things help mm. help you okay cool i want to make a dish and i can create my own dish because i know that these things work together and that that's like the cool thing and that's like how i that's what i learn this stuff for is so i so that i can just dash this dash that and i know that it's going to be good right you know the effects i'm gonna come over to your kitchen and hang out i might learn something <laughs> Hey, you're you're always welcome. All right, all right. 
Oh yeah. So guys, uh, if you want to improve your Christmas dinner, read this article and tweet at Dwayne because Dwayne has all the answers. Um, <laughs> Hannah, didn't they have one they were suggesting cooking like pudding with a blowtorch or something? That didn't look safe. I don't know what that is. Like, there was one dish in there. And I don't yeah. know about that blowtorch shit, Dwayne. I don't so, know how that all works. So what I actually love cooking with alcohol, and I'm glad that they made a point in it. If you're cooking with alcohol, you got to cook with a high proof, and you got to cook at high temperatures. Because mm -hmm. if, if you don't cook at high temperatures, it won't ignite the alcohol. And then bad things are going to happen. <laughs> yeah. No, I cook with beer all the time just because usually it's laying around the house. But seriously, beer, like chicken, like beer can chicken, I'm sure you've heard of that. It's one of the greatest things on the planet. Um, but yeah, I, I certainly, when I'm making seasoning, if I've got like a dark, arrogant bastard or something type of real like heavy thick, that, that yeah, you, you can do much with a Coors Light. You want to go up with a little something with some, some kick, you know? Well, I, uh, I, I make and it's it's really the only dessert that I really know how to make. It's uh, bananas foster, mm -hmm. and, I, and I make it with uh, ninety nine bananas and oh. one fifty one. Oh wow! You're just going for it. Mm. You so can, I, that's the way I was taught how to make it. You get two extra chip in one fifty one, man. Well, I mean, when you, when you cook with it, it, it all burns off. Like sure. it gives you that nice, like robust flavor to balance the sugar and the butter that that's in that's in it. Shit, Hannah, we might get picked up by the cooking channel if we play our cards right. <laughs> yeah, I was initially thinking the science channel, but now? No, I go either way, somewhere in the middle. We're like a hybrid. Somewhere, somewhere in the middle. So, I mean, definitely give these tips a try, guys. Uh, do it safely. Um, if the alcohol doesn't ignite, it might be a bad time, but you're really going to enjoy those Brussels sprouts, with that, which at the end of the day is all that matters. Um, Dwayne, if people want to come to you for cooking tips um for christmas just right around the corner uh where can the people find you online uh you can find me everywhere and when i say everywhere i mean any platform that i'm on at burke made it's the same on every single platform you're awesome. smart i got like six aliases so I, I i can't you know go with that kind of technique and approach to social media you know i might be johnny winters on instagram and i might be uh I might be uh, snub nose Johnny on uh, Twitter. You never know. I keep changing these things. I don't. No one needs to know what I'm up to. If you need to find me, send Brandon Hanna a text. He can find me. <laughs> or if, uh, or we, we know where we can find you on Twitter because it says it down below. It's true. Um, if, if if you want to, do, do either of you have anything that you'd like to plug in addition to your social media handles before we uh, hmm. close off the show here today? Dwayne, uh, I do actually tomorrow on the very net oh, God damn it. a very netflix christmas musical channel on uh youtube we will be dropping our zoom recorded uh version of the musical that i have been editing over the past two weeks um and i'm actually still working on right now <laughs> um but that, that will be premiering tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. Pacific uh, on YouTube. I'll be in the chat. Uh, I don't know if any of the actors, but I'm pretty sure the director, writer, uh, one of the producers or a few of the producers will be in the chat uh, watching along with everybody. Um, I think it, it's going to be about 70 minutes long ish. Um, but please come check it out. Uh, you know, like it and and have fun with it because it's a lot of fun and i really enjoyed this process of working on a musical which i've never done before pretty rad i did tinder the musical you can google that that's real, <laughs> that's very real. Google john kaiser tinder the musical i promise you uh, a funnier die video will pop up so awesome. i'm gonna promote something i made seven years ago go watch the music. <laughs> perfect uh that is that is that is just about perfect. Definitely check both of these out. One is a little more pressing than the other, but mm -hmm. definitely uh, check both out if you can. Uh, I'm really excited uh, for that musical, Dwayne, and I'll be sure to to watch along as well. And of course, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Brandon Hanna zero seven. 
Um, like I said, guys, thank you so much for, for watching. I uh, thank you so much to Dwayne and Kaiser for being on the show today. Super grateful to have you. It was a, a, a lot of fun. Um, and I love what you guys bring to the periodic table, if you will. And thank you so much to Haskell 420, BCD, Jeremy Miller, or, oh, sorry, Jeremy Miller, uh, William Belford, um, Will McLean, uh, Jake Yacoveta, and of course, uh, Sabrina Ramirez. Thank you so much for joining us in the chat today. Um, and yes, one more chance for me to plug uh, my film physics Christmas yeah, special. Working hard on this right now, guys. Uh, I like can't I just, wait to see that, man. That's going to be a hell of a, you know, that's the thing about Die Hard. Just when you think you've seen it 10 times, know it, read all the stories, someone comes up with some fresh new look at it and it never gets old. So please let me know when that's going to air, Hannah, because I don't want to miss that. Definitely will do. Hopefully in time for Christmas, working hard on it. Got all the math figured out just about and just tweaking a few more things and, uh, I'll be good to go shoot this thing and crank it out. I'm super excited. I've had a lot of fun doing the research for it. Um, made some discoveries of my own that I did not expect. And I'm really excited to share with you all. Uh, but until I do that, until next time, um, you know, uh, we just actually uh, had the, the last day of Hanukkah. So I just want to say happy Hanukkah to all of uh, my happy Jewish Hanukkah, friends. Happy Hanukkah. Happy Hanukkah. Um, and, every, and all of our, you know, Christian friends uh, celebrating Christmas uh, this week. Uh, uh, Merry Christmas, uh, and uh, we will see you all next weekend. And um, yeah, I kind of lost my train of thought for there, but thank you so much. Well, that's because you're on LSD right now, Hannah. <laughs> um, no, I don't think that's it at all. No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Scott, for Scott. time out of your day for this.